Our program tonight focuses primarily on recycling and especially plastics recycling. It addresses three topics along the life cycle of a recycled container. The first topic is proposed extended producer responsibility legislation. The concept here is for those who actually decide to use plastic packaging for their products to be more responsible for what happens to the packages post-use. Ideally, this would eventually lead to reduced amounts of plastic materials entering the waste stream. There are only two states with such laws, Maine and Oregon, but New York does have a proposed bill in the Senate. We'll hear about New York's proposed legislation from Senator Pete Harcum and about Oregon's EPR law from Peter Spendelo, who helped develop that state's legislation. Next, we all have been separating our recyclables from other waste for many years. Our communities diligently collect this from our blue bins and most transfer the materials to locally Westchester County for continued processing. So what does the county actually do with it? How is it processed to be usable? How much of what's collected actually is resold? What kinds of products is it used for? This is our second topic. And the third topic is about refining our recycling practices. So how clean does my bottle or can need to be? What do I do with the plastic bottle caps? If I have something, I'm not sure if it's recyclable or not. Should I include it or not include it? So some of those kinds of questions. To address these, these top two topics, we are privileged to have three of Westchester County's most knowledgeable officials. Peter McCart, who covers this area for the county executive, and Louis Vitrone and Melissa Rotini, who hands-on manage the solid waste operations for the county. So now into our program. To start it off, I'd like to introduce Ann Swaim, Sawmill River Audubon Executive Director and lifelong birder and environmentalist to connect recycling with birds and wildlife habitat. Thanks, Tom. Uh, really a great lineup of speakers. Uh, we're so pleased to be recording tonight because we know a lot of other people are interested in this program. Uh, I want to take just a, a few moments to go to the question of why is Audubon doing a program on plastics recycling? And to do that, uh, I want to tell you where I was this afternoon. I was at Rockefeller State Park with a group of school kids looking at ospreys, looking at a Baltimore Oriole. Actually saw the red-headed woodpecker there, which is pretty cool. So what's, how does that connect with what we're doing tonight, the picture from today? Um, birds. We're all about birds because birds are the most visible wildlife on the planet. They fly. They make noise. They're visible in the winter, they're largely diurnal out in the day. And when we go birding, we track not just birds, but we track the health of the habitats. And the land and the water and the habitats around us are not just for birds, they're our health too. So whatever happens in the land and the water affects the habitats, affects birds, and affects our health and our future. So Sawmill River Audubon over the last few years has had uh, some dedicated board members who have been digging into questions about climate change and about the decline of birds, which measures the health of habitats, and this program is arising out of that passion, out of that work. So if you don't know already, we recommend to you the website 3 Billion Birds. It was a bit overrun by the pandemic. This stunning scientific study came out just before the pandemic hit us. And rightfully enough, our attention turned elsewhere. But what the study showed us is that we've lost one third of North America's birds since 1970 or three billion birds. There's anecdotal stories that we're telling each other. Some of us are old enough to remember driving through the country on roads at night and what happened to the windshield. It was covered with bugs. That doesn't happen today. The land, the insects, birds, the small things that hold the world together. So it's not all doom and gloom. Some birds have increased and there are actions we can all take. Yes, we need big actions on the part of governments, but there's small actions that we can take too. And one of those happens to do with plastics. So the questions of recycling comes right home when we're thinking about actions to help birds or think about the health of the planet and the health of bird populations. So if you wanna learn more about these, go to 3billionbirds.org 
and um, consider some of those actions. So tonight's program, tonight's topic, the work of the great people who are joining us online tonight, questions of birds, questions of the habitat and the health of the planet. That's all for the future, isn't it? In 2019, we had the program, I believe it was December 10th at the county center. Little did we know that a few weeks later, the world would be shut down. But at that event, we were lucky enough to have Pete Harcum and Peter McCart as two of our top speakers. And so greatly appreciate Pete, both Pete's and Peter and the constant involvement of the county and the generosity of people like them and Lou and Melissa in assisting us with these programs. Um, I'd like to introduce Peter Harcum now. And for those of you who don't remember, Pete and I first met the first day as freshmen in high school over at Clarkstown North, played soccer together for four years, probably pretty badly, but had a lot of fun. And um, Pete is in his second term as a New York State Senator. He will be running for a third term as soon as he um, knows that he actually has a district to run in, but I assume that's a, somewhat of a given um, and will be sorted out. And Pete has consistently been generous with his time with Salma River Audubon. When we reach out to him, the only question he, questions he asks are, when and what do you want me to speak about? So Pete, if you could let us know what's going on at the state at this point and uh, the extended producer responsibility legislation. And if you'd like, very briefly, the mention you made of um, citing solar arrays in parking lots for municipalities. And thank you so much. I want to thank Sawmill River Audubon for all you do and Ann and Tom and the board and, and all your members. Um, just thank you for everything you do. And I want to give you um, I want to circle back on something that we spoke about last time that um, State Audubon was very, very active in supporting. Uh, you remember we talked about our wetlands le legislation that would protect uh, wetlands in New York State. Um, the governor put a version of my bill into the budget. Um, we had my bill in the Senate one house and then the, as the assembly had a version and through great negotiations, with Steve Engelbright and the governor, and thanks to Todd Kaminsky, our environmental chair, we now have uh, uh, legis legislation in place starting in five years that will protect millions and millions of acres of wetlands in New York State. And so you should be proud of that for habitat, for water quality, um, and Audubon was a big part of that. So thank you, big thank you. The other thing I wanna say as, as I start is, if I, if I talk about recycling um, in a negative light, I, I am not doing it um, in the context of Westchester County. We, they, we have amazing uh, folks in Westchester. I work with them closely when I was a county legislator. So I'm, I'm speaking more statewide and, and, and nationally when, when I give a couple numbers. So, so why do we need extended producer responsibility? Here's a number that, that shocked me. Um, that only 2% of all recycled material achieves circularity. That means it's then um, reproduced and in, into a, another product that is sold in the marketplace, only 2%. When we talk about plastics, only 13% of plastics are recycled. They're expecting to double the no amount of plastics produced in the next 20 years and only 1% of carpet in New York, and we'll talk about carpet in a little bit, 515 million pounds of carpet go in the landfills every year. And, and who's paying for this? Taxpayers are paying for this. Municipalities used to make a lot of money on recycling, but the marketplace is not there anymore. So the burden falls to the taxpayer. And so that's why we talk about extended producer responsibility because the polluters pay. The folks who create the packaging are the ones who end up paying. And what it does is it will force them to think about the costs of, of disposal 
at the time that they're creating the packaging uh, for particular projects. So products. So it reduces packaging. It encourages recycled content. Um, it will reduce the taxes on the taxpayers um, and relieve the burden on municipalities. As you mentioned in the beginning, Canada, Europe, Oregon, Maine, all have versions of this that work. They reduce emissions um, and it increases the amount of recycled content and smart packaging in the marketplace. So there are two bills in the Senate. Um, one is extended producer responsibility and the other deals specifically with carpet. And in many ways, they're, they're kind of like the CLCPA. They set up a structure of advisory boards of stakeholders, environmentalists, health officials, members of the business community who are involved in the creation and the sale of, of packaging content. Um, and they come up with plans uh, and set a fee by what the, um, what the package is, what the material is. And so the, the worse the, the package, the higher the fee. The better the packaging material, the less of the packaging material, it'll be a lower fee. And this will be set up again through these advisory councils, um, the way we did with the CLCPA. Uh, the carpeting is a little different. That will have its own. Um, that's a bill by Senator Kavanaugh. And the extended producer responsibility bill we're talking about is from Senator Kaminsky. So there are two different bills. Um, but the carpet bill, um, in five years, if we reduce 25% uh, of the amount of carpet going to landfill, it's the equivalent of reducing emissions of 32,000 cars. So, you know, it, it's a cost factor, it's an emissions factor, it's a water quality um, issue. 70% of recyclable materials winds up in landfills. Again, I'm not, I'm not pointing to Westchester County, but statewide and nationally, that seems to be the trend. So that's why this kind of legislation is important. Um, you know, my, my former wife, who many of you know, is very involved um, with, with the sustainability movement, she used to say, we have a systems problem. And this is a prime example, the way we handle waste nationally, the way we think of packaging, um, that right now it's kind of this disposal economy and, and the cost and the burden are put on taxpayers and municipalities, and we need to shift the paradigm of the system, and, and we put the responsibility and the burden on those who are producing the packaging. So that's quick snapshot. Um, the Kavanaugh bill actually passed on the floor this week. So we, we've passed the carpet bill in the Senate, and the Kaminsky extended producer responsibility bill um, has passed out of the Environmental Conservation Committee, which I serve on, and, and we're, we're fighting to get that to the floor for a full vote. Um, to be fair, there, there is a side in this argument that says you don't need, you know, the councils, you don't need to loop everybody in, you just need the government to set reduction uh, targets and force business to do that. And there's a way to do that, but but I think you get a better result when you have all of the stakeholders at the table. You're, you're not compromising on your goals and your targets, but you're allowing the industry some flexibility in how they get there because they're the ones who know their business. But I really look forward to hearing what Peter's gonna say next because he was very involved in doing this in Oregon. So I'm looking forward to hearing what, what his perspective is and, and what, what their experience in, in Oregon is. So if you want more information on these bills, I can, I can get them to you. I'll put my uh, Senate contact in the chat. Uh, it's always great to be with you all and look forward to the rest of the presentation. Thank you so much. So Pete, you mentioned something before the presentation and I know it's a little off topic, but um, it's important to the climate change issue and to things that we've discussed. And I know Richard Sarave and Bill Kellner on our committee have talked about the siting of solar panels in parking lots. Could you just talk to that just a quick minute on what you indicated to all of us before? 
Yeah, what you're talking about is, um, and I've worked with Pete McCart closely on this, uh, if currently um, municipalities are looking to build solar canopies over the parking lots in their town parks, their county parks. It's a great way to do community solar. You don't have to go through the planning board. You don't have to go through the zoning board. It's, it's municipal owned property. Um, it's a great way to build community solar as we're trying to fast track. It, it avoids taking a farmland. It avoids taking a open space. But the problem is because it's parkland, they have to go through the alienation process, which means coming to the state legislature, which could add a year or two years to the process. They could lose incentives uh, at, uh, in, the, in the intervening time. So I passed legislation in the Senate to allow municipalities to build solar canopies over the impervious surface without coming to us for alienation. So now the big push is in the assembly who has a very um, strong view on alienation. Um, and so they're very protective of parkland, even the parking lots. So we passed it last year. We couldn't get it through in the assembly, but we're working with folks over there and, and with good advocacy from folks like you, hopefully we can get it done this year and signed into law. Great. Thanks, Ken. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you for being here tonight and providing us with that important, all of that important information. Now I'd like to introduce Peter Spendelow. And Peter is a fascinating story um, because Peter uh, grew up in Chappaqua, town of Newcastle, and graduated from Greeley, I believe, in 1970, was at the first Earth Day at Greeley High School with members of our organization, including um, Stan and Rita Wecker, and Pete Seeger did a benefit concert that day, and Ann Swain was able to locate pictures from that event in 1970. So Peter Spendelow, his parents are longer standing members of Audubon, and Peter is a member as of 1968. And Peter eventually made his way out to Washington and Oregon and was directly involved in the enactment of legislation in Oregon of a producer responsibility bill. So with that introduction, Peter, thank you for reaching out to us. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. But uh, yeah, I am a longtime Audubon member uh, going back again till 1968. And although I've been on the West Coast since uh, 1974, um, I've uh, actually since before then. I've uh, since 1970. I've kept up my membership in Audubon. So let me uh, share my slides here um, because I only have a few minutes. I won't be able to get into a lot of things, but uh, I do agree with Pete that I think industry does need to have a lot of flexibility on how they implement these laws because they are the ones who know about it. Uh, but I want to start out with some background on Oregon's law and the problem that this is addressing in Oregon. Our system in, in Oregon is very different from yours in that we have, uh, in, in Oregon, it's not the municipalities that provide recycling collection and garbage services and, and that sort of thing. The municipalities franchise local garbage companies to do those sorts of collections and it's working out really well. So our law concentrates not so much on the collection, it concentrates on certain parts of the collection, it more concentrates on making sure the material that we collect gets properly managed, gets used in, in the best way. So just quickly giving some history, Oregon was the first state passing a bottle bill. Uh, we were the first state passing a statewide recycling law, the Oregon Recycling Opportunity Act, which brought curbside recycling to populations of cities with 4,000 more population. Uh, as we were implementing that, we started out really not knowing what we were doing, but we improved over time. We found out that for instance, when you provided people with a recycling bin, participation really increased. It went from like 20% up to 80%. So uh, we, we started doing that. Um, we passed a law in 1991 that had many different aspects, but I'm just gonna highlight the rigid plastic container part of that law, which made it so that anybody uh, who is packaging in rigid plastic containers had to make sure that those containers either had recycled content 
or were being recycled at a rate of 25% or above. And that led to adding uh, a lot of plastics to our curbside program. Um, the thing I think is most impactful though was starting around 2003 and, and continuing over the years as different communities joined in, we found that um, giving people a large cart to put their recycling in and uh, uh, commingling the different materials, except for we keep glass out. Glass is just a serious problem. It, it does not belong in a commingled recycling cart. So we've been really good at that. Unfortunately, the rest of the country hasn't been so good at that. But um, we found that we really increased the amount of good material we want to recycle by giving people large carts and allowing them to commingle it so they have a place to store it all without having to have it all over in separate bins all over the place. Uh, but unfortunately, doing that also means that you get a lot more contamination because people, uh, they, it's the uh, want to recycle sort of people like, I've got this thing, I don't know if it's recyclable or not, I'm going to throw it in the cart and if it is recyclable, they'll figure it out and they'll sort it out. And that causes a serious problem. To give you an idea of what that problem is, this is what we call um, from a paper mill that takes a lot of Washington and Oregon paper, and it's the graph of the pulper rejects. Pulper rejects are things that go that they buy as paper, go into their paper mill, goes into the pulper that's supposed to make the pulp that's going to use to make new paper, but it doesn't pulp out. It comes out the end, and if you look back to like 1997 you'll see that the amount of pulp or rejects was really low. It was only about 1%. But as more and more communities moved to commingled recycling in Washington and Oregon, those rates really started increasing to the point where by 2010, it's up on the order of 15 to 20% of the material that these mills were buying as paper ended up being garbage that they had to turn around and pay to dispose. And that was a serious problem. But they couldn't adopt standards to make it um, to cut down on the amount of contamination because there was competition for that paper. There were Asian buyers, buyers from China and other Southeast Asian countries who were willing to buy this really contaminated paper because they had cheap ways of sorting out the contaminants with you know, cheap labor over there. And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, let's see if this works here. Yeah. Here we go. This is the back of the pulper at that North Pack mill. And you can see the stuff falling out of it. it. There's a lot of plastic there. It's actually not so much plastic as you think. The plastic jugs sort of float on the top and they sort of concentrate where you are visible. But you can see there's just a lot of junk that was coming. It's sold to this thing as good newspaper and coming out as stuff they then had to pay to dispose of. Well, I mentioned before about how there were these, uh, this competition for paper and this put, you know, really economic stress on the paper mills. And then add to that was we all moved to electronic means of getting our news and getting our information. And the amount of newspaper that people, that the mills were producing really declined because newspapers just weren't published as much. The Oregonian, the local paper here, for instance, switched to only publishing four days a week instead of publishing daily. And the amount of advertising they had just kept on dropping and dropping as more and more people turn to online services. And so we lost our major newspaper mills. We lost the, the, the companies that were buying the bulk of the material that we were collecting for recycling. But that didn't cause a problem immediately because again, we still had those Asian buyers who were willing to pay top dollar for this contaminated material until they weren't. And in 2018, the Chinese government stepped in and said, no more, we're not taking the rest of the world's trash. It's not just Oregon stuff, it's stuff from all over, from Europe, from other countries, all over the place. They shut it off. They said, no more receiving post-consumer plastic, no more receiving mixed paper. This stuff causes us problems. Uh, plastic China Way is a great uh, documentary that documents that. Uh, one of the pictures from Plastics China shows the sort of awful conditions that people were sorting in to take the stuff and sort it out. And I mentioned before about how the, um, you know, the paper mills would have a lot of plastic in them. This picture is not of a plastics recycling operation and the junk there. This is the stuff coming out of a paper mill in Southeast Asia where they simply pile the, the stuff that doesn't pulp out there. They probably pull out some of the plastic that has some value but then they just burn the rest off or it blows, or they leave it there or it blows into the ocean. It's, it's all sorts of uh, problems that are coming up there uh, based on the practices that we had of how well we sorted our paper. 
And that was really the serious issue that we had to deal with. Now, I want to step back here and say that we've been thinking a lot about solid waste for a while. We used to be the solid waste section and uh, dealing with solid waste and recycling. We've renamed ourselves to the materials management program now because we realize that the problems with materials stem not so much from what you do at the end of life, particularly here in the United States, where we have good landfills with um, you know, all sorts of leachate collection and, and all sorts of different systems to, to reduce the environmental impacts of it. The problems with materials comes from the production of them and the, in the first place. It's the cutting down trees. It's the pulling oil out of the ground and digging minerals out of the ground. It's all the manufacturing that produces a lot of greenhouse gases and a lot of different pollutants. That is where the damage is. The damage from landfilling stuff is relatively small compared to the damage from producing the stuff in the first place. And so we adopted our, our uh, 2050 vision and framework for action for materials management or Oregon back in 2012. And it's with these thoughts that we had that we, uh, when we ran into this problem of all of a sudden the markets for our paper disappearing overnight practically, and you know, our places not knowing what to do with the material, we ended up disposing of some 16,000 tons of good collected recyclables simply because we didn't have the, um, the processing capacity to handle it at the time. We were not set, set up for it and we didn't have the markets for it at the time. Um, we've since fixed that, but we, we looked at what we wanted to do on the long term. And that is where we decided to work on this uh, bill we eventually passed in uh, June of last year. Uh, called uh, we call it the Recycling Modernization Act, uh, and this put producers gave them major responsibility for our recycling system. Up until now, they had no responsibility at all. They could produce you know PET bottles, PET plastic bottles, and put polyvinyl chloride labels on them, which is just a disaster as far as recycling goes because those are completely incompatible plastics. But they could do that, and it wouldn't make you know it wouldn't hurt them at all. But it would take our plastic and make it so some of that stuff wasn't recyclable anymore. And so those were the sorts of problems that we wanted to face. Um, and again, as Pete said, this is legislation which is common in other places, it's common throughout Europe, throughout many of the Canadian provinces, but it hasn't been brought here to the United States until last year. And Oregon and Maine are the first two states that uh, passed this legislation. Um, and it's going to take a while, by the way, to implement it. In our case, it's going to be till 2025 before we get this thing fully implemented because there's so much the producers have to do. So um, let me just give a little bit of work on how this works. The producers, first of all, have to get together to form one or more producer responsibility organizations. It's the organization which will be responsible for all the things that this law requires, which are many different things. I'm only gonna to touch on a few of them, but it's many different things this law requires. So who are the producers? They're the people like Procter & Gamble, for instance, that you know, make things like shampoo and so on and sell it here. There are uh, you know, grocery places that package stuff. There's a lot of different producers out there. We give exemptions to some of the smaller ones and we exempt the bottle bill material because Basically, they have their own producer responsibility organization already, which is very successful in Oregon. Um, you know, about 90% return rates uh, through our redemption system. But anyway, the producers get together and they form these producer responsibility organizations, which then look at all the things that the state is requiring them to do, and they develop a plan that says how they are going to implement the state's requirements. And they submit that to us. And the sort of requirements they talk about are things like expanding recycling service to the rural areas where we don't have it, doing more work on cleaning up contamination and educating people on how to do things. Um, there's uh, provisions for if the markets go south and all of a sudden recycling gets very expensive, they're gonna have to chip in money to make sure that our collectors at least can drop off their material for free instead of having to pay to drop off the recycling they collect. Um, they're gonna have to pay a contamination management fee. And then a couple of important things is they have to make sure the material goes to a responsible end market. And so, and then this is in partnership with the processors who are private companies, not the local governments, they're private companies in Oregon that receive the commingled recyclables and sort them out and sell, you know, the paper to the paper mills and the plastics to the plastic pro uh, processors and so on. Um, we're gonna put standards on those processors because that's where a lot of the contamination has come at before you saw all those plastic bottles dropping out of the end of that Norpac mill. Those were things that were missorted. They should have been going into a plastic bale, not into a paper bale. 
and we're going to make sure that the, we adopt standards that will improve the clean, the how clean these materials are. Because again, we really think it's important to make sure these materials go to proper end markets. Uh, other sorts of things they do is that uh, again our Existing system with existing haulers will take care of the general commingled recyclables, but things that can't go in the recycling bin, we're going to rely on the producers to deal with those. So things like film plastic, for instance. Uh, we're, now, we haven't made decisions on this. This is things that we're going to be working on, but this is a very likely candidate for a material that we will require the producers to figure out some way to recycle film plastic because it does not belong in the commingled bin where it can cause significant problems. They're going to have plastic packaging recycling goals that they have to meet, which are extremely aggressive. Um, and so they're going to have to figure out their own programs for collecting additional plastics if the curbside programs and so on aren't, aren't meeting the goal. And again, I mentioned that both the uh, producers and the processors will be responsible for making sure materials are going to responsible end markets, meaning they're not going to go to a country where they don't have a solid waste system that can properly deal with the contaminants. And they're not going to be made into products that cause significant environmental harm. So, uh, and anyway, there's just a whole lot of things that they have to do. Um, I just uh, have a few minutes here. So let me just finish off by saying um, that uh, we do have provisions in our law, similar to what Pete mentioned, that will make it so the producers who are producing things that are more difficult to recycle or that cause significant environmental damage, will end up having to pay more because of that, that we're hoping that, you know, or even the small states, so I don't know how much impact we're going to have, but if other states join us with these sorts of provisions, it's going to make a difference, and we will see uh, a lot of the bad sort of packaging disappear. Um, and again, we're really concentrating on trying to make sure that the life cycle impacts are reduced. It's, this is not a bill to maximize recycling. This is a bill to maximize environmental benefits. And if environmental benefits meaning using less of materials instead of producing a lot of it, they recycle, that is a good thing. And we support that. So this is how we've tried to set up our law. Uh, being one of the first, I'm sure we've made a bunch of mistakes, but we are trying our hardest to implement that. We have a lot of just a huge number of advisory groups, including I was just in a four hour meeting today talking about different plastics. So we have, we're just doing a lot. I just want to last, and one last thing, which is we're really trying to uh, advance equity in this. And it's not just equity here among, you know, in Oregon. It's looking again at those conditions which, where we sent material and trying to reduce the sort of negative impact we have there. But here in Oregon, we're talking about things like protecting the recycling factory workers, the, the sorters. I mean, that's an awful job if you've ever seen sorting uh, people working on a sort line. It's a very hard job. Living wages for these workers, just a lot of things we're trying to do to, tr to make things more equitable for everybody. So with that, I will close and um, hopefully we'll have some questions and when we get to the Q&A part and the discussion at the end. Uh, thank you. So let me get to my slides. Um, um, Peter, that was awesome. Thank you for that presentation. The amount of material, no pun intended, that you included in that presentation was really amazing and very educational. Now I want to introduce Pete McCart. I'll keep it short that he's currently Director of Energy Conservation and Sustainability for Westchester County. Um, he is an avid birder. He, his bio describes several positions that he's held on boards, including Sustainable Westchester and still holds in some instances, East Chester's Environmental Committee, Friends of Twin Lakes County Park, et cetera. So Pete, thank you for your ongoing involvement and thank you for your work as Director of Energy Conservation and for your willingness to talk to all of us today and the time that you put in talking to us in preparation for this meeting. Well, no problem at all, guys. You know, I, I am truly an avid birder, a budding birder, really. I, you know, I, I, I learned from, from man and all of you all uh, I, I was an avid um, a participant in the uh, bird chats that Ann did. Those were just fantastic and so enjoyable. I just want to be clear that we are very supportive of the, the uh, EPR law. Uh, we actually wrote letters of support uh, for the EPR law uh, from the county executive, um, not just the county, but also from DEF and all of us were really, uh, really behind that. And, 
And, you know, to a point we were hoping that it would be expanded, but, you know, first steps, you know, this sort of thing. And not to get in competition with Oregon at all, don't want to get there, but, you know, New York State does a lot of really great things, and we're, we're ahead in some ways, and, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's all good is the way I look at it. And, uh, you know, Pete, I really appreciate you, um, you know, your presentation here and, and giving us, uh, you know, a view of what's going on in Oregon. But I get the benefit of here of introducing um, Lou and Melissa, and I, you know, this is going to take a, like a little bit of time. But I, I think it's really important to show that. And you know, Melissa's like just shaking her head. No, don't take a lot of time. Well, Melissa, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go on yours a little more shallow than than Lou's. But I really do want to talk about. You know, Lou is a, a true professional. It's like. Um, he served as the deputy commissioner of the Westchester County DEF, Department of Environmental Facilities, since 2009. And he overse oversees the administration and operation and, you know, coming up with all these creative uh, initiatives and innovative uh, programs that we have. Um, him and, um, uh, you know, Melissa, you're going to hear more about it. I don't want to step on their toes too much. Uh, prior to that, he served as deputy director of the Cal County Solid Waste Commission. Uh, he previously served uh, in the general counsel's office of New York City Council and as a, uh, an assistant district attorney for Nassau County. He currently serves on the board of the New York chapter of SWANA, and I'll let him uh, get that acronym, but I believe it's the Solid Waste Association of New York. Yeah, I'm not exactly okay. sure. And he is the past president. Most, most uh, recently, when we first uh, came on, he was the board of that. I was like, wow. Uh, Lou is a graduate of Fordham Law and lives right here in uh, Scarsdale. And um, he serves as a volunteer EMT. And uh, he's on the board of uh, uh, Scarsdale's uh, Volunteer a uh, Ambulance Board. And Melissa, who um, I first got to meet um, at, when she was in her uh, job working for the county attorney. She's a, She is also an attorney. Uh, she's the assistant commissioner in the county's Department of um, DEF, uh, responsibilities in the county's refuse and recycling divisions and compliance concerns. She's got the passion. She knows all about this. She's, she, these people are pros. They know more about this than I will ever know about it. And that's why I asked them to uh, join us and they, you know, readily just, you know, they came right in and, and, and uh, are happy to, to uh, participate. I just want to say one more time, though, that the county executive uh, we're very fortunate to have, uh, you know, uh, County Executive Latimer, you know, um, in, in his position. Elections do have uh, 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 consequences. We've got Pete Harcum. We love Pete. We love, we love our senators. We love our governors. We're very fortunate here in Westchester and New York State that we do have uh, the elected officials that are steering us in the right way. Um, you know, we got to move to renewable energy. Um, and we got to, uh, you know, uh, do what we can to mitigate uh, climate change. But that's enough, and uh, I can rattle on all night about, you know, birds and, 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 and garbage and recycling, and I won't. But, Lou, <laughs> um, it's all up to you, buddy. Thank you so much for, for participating, you and Melissa. I really appreciate it, guys. Well, uh, well, thank you so much for that introduction. So, Melissa and I tonight, we're going to, we're going to tell you, uh, as you've heard, we're going to talk a little bit about Westchester's waste and recycling system, how we handle uh, the waste and recycling throughout the county. And then hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll dispel some of the myths uh, that, uh, that many of you have about recycling, at least as it relates to Westchester. And I'll say this, I, you know, I, I listened very intently to, to Peter uh, Spendelow's presentation. I'm very interested in, in what they're doing with um, uh, EPR uh, out there, but our system does operate much differently uh, than, than theirs does. So some of the things that Peter said are, are going to be uh, different when we talk about Westchester and how we handle waste and recycling. So any conversation about uh, waste and recycling in Westchester County starts with uh, an explanation of the county's refuse disposal district. The disposal district, if we can go back to the disposal district, that, that was formed by New York state law uh, back in the early 1980s. The county's disposal district is the blue shaded area on the map there. Although it's only about 60% of the county geographically, it's a little over 90% of the county's population. 
our department, the Department of Environmental Facilities, specifically the, the solid waste division, the refuse division, we manage uh, the operations for, of, the, of the county's disposal district. But we're also the New York State designated uh, planning unit for solid waste for the entire county. So we do interact with the seven towns in the Northeast that do not belong to the district. We, we work with them very closely on waste and recycling. They are much more sparsely populated and, uh, and, and more rural. So they're about 10% of the county population. Um, all of, and we're gonna talk about this in, in a little more detail. We handle all of the county's residential curbside recycling, the processing of that material and sales of that material. And we handle uh, the disposal of all of the county, all of the district's residential solid waste. Uh, we have a myriad of other programs. We'll, we'll have time to touch on some of them, but not all of them. We're going to talk in more detail about the food waste programs that we've started. Uh, we have an organic yard waste program where we handle uh, the, the grass clippings and leaves for uh, about 23 of the district member municipalities to the tune of about 125,000 tons a year of uh, organic yard waste that goes to composting facilities outside of the county. Um, we have boat wrap recycling is a program that where we collect boat wrap, the plastic boat wrap that protects the uh, vessels in the off season. We collect that along the Hudson River and along the Long Island Sound uh, every spring. We're doing that right now. E-waste collection. Um, we have collection pods for electronic waste um, staged at 27 different locations throughout the county in 27 different municipalities. And we collect over 3 million pounds of electronic waste every year. Whatever can be recycled out of that electronic waste is recycled. Uh, and and uh, we, we handle the disposal of the material we can't recycle uh, properly, make sure that that's handled properly. We have medication collection. That's not a recycling program. It's a disposal program but we want to ensure that it doesn't get into our waterways or it doesn't get into the wrong hands. So we have 39 uh, collection bins set up at police departments throughout the county. I'd like to say that within Westchester County, you're never more than five miles away from a medication drop-off box. We also collected at our HMARC, our, our Household Material Recovery Facility in Valhalla. And we're going to talk about that facility um, in a little while, but the HMARF, people can, can drop off virtually anything that's not collected curbside can be dropped off at our HMARF. Um, and that includes household chemicals, uh, cleaning supplies, fertilizers, pesticides, tires, e-waste. They can bring documents for shredding. They can drop off mercury containing devices. They can drop off Freon appliances. We collect it all again. Whatever can be recycled is recycled. And, and whatever is not recycled is properly disposed of. We also, so as far as the solid waste, I should have mentioned, we, have, we, we also control three transfer stations where we receive the waste. We're gonna talk about where that waste goes. It all goes to the Charles Point Waste to Energy Facility in, uh, in Peekskill. Uh, we do not landfill any of the county's solid waste. All the recyclables, we'll talk about our MRF, our material recovery facility in Yonkers, in a little while as well. All of, the, all of the recyclables handled down there. Melissa, any programs you wanted to touch on that I did not talk about? Textile recycling, that's another uh, program we have at the HMRF. Anything else? I was going to say, we'll, we'll get to them when we hit the HMRF slide. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's, uh, let's move on. So uh, as I said, all of the county's residential solid waste is disposed of at a waste to energy facility. Uh, it creates uh, enough energy to power about 64,000 homes, uh, the, P the RESCO facility up in Peekskill. Um, about 90% of all of Westchester's waste, that's commercial, residential, um, about 90% of all of the waste, district, non-district, goes to a waste to energy facility. Most of that is the RESCO facility in Peekskill. Some of it goes to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and even less, very small amount uh, goes up to Dutchess County, but about 90% of all of Westchester's waste avoids going to a landfill. 
That's uh, you can compare that to the rest of the United States, where only about 11.8 percent goes to waste energy, and and over 88 uh, percent goes to a, a landfill. Um, and why is that important? Um, I'll be the first to tell you that waste energy is not a perfect technology. It creates carbon emissions, um, but it is a greenhouse gas mitigator. Landfill, when you landfill your waste, you're creating methane, which is a much, much more potent greenhouse gas uh, up to, you know, depending on the studies you see, up to, from 30 to, to 60 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon. So uh, there are downsides to waste energy, as I said, it's cre- it's, it is creating carbon, but the only alternative that's feasible right now, um, and, and we all support zero waste and we wanna get there, but as we're getting there, uh, the only other alternative is landfilling waste and, and waste energy is far superior to landfilling waste. Um, uh, the waste energy uh, facility also uh, is, is equipped and was retrofitted with uh, scrubbers and, uh, and, and other equipment to remove NOx and SOx emissions, mercury, and, and other things from, uh, from the air emissions. All of, the, all of the recycling, the district's recycling is processed at our material recovery facility or MRF in Yonkers. Uh, at, on average, between 75 and 80,000 tons of curbside recycling uh, a year gets processed at the MRF. Um, the MRF was retrofitted 10 years ago. We're continually upgrading it, looking for new, equi- new equipment, uh, new automation, uh, so we can make that material, and we'll talk about why this is important, but make that material as clean as possible, as contamination-free as possible. Um, and, and that's why we're able to market our material. Okay, so as Lou mentioned, we offer a hazardous material recovery facility in Valhalla um, that is open by appointment Tuesdays through Saturdays. The appointment makes it very easy for residents to come We handle all kinds of specialized recyclables, as Lou mentioned, household chemicals, flammable liquids, pesticides, wood stains, freon containing appliances, vehicle and rechargeable batteries, CFL light bulbs, uh, scrap metal. We have our shredder available for documents. If you have documents saved up or you're doing a clean out, we also have textiles, as Lou mentioned, we just expanded our program. Actually, we are working with um, a new company that expanded the amount of materials we can take. And by that, I mean, we take not only uh, clothing in various conditions of repair, but we also now can take leather goods, shoes, uh, costumes, if you've got old Halloween costumes, and they also can take small area rugs, which is great as we await the larger carpeting EPR, uh, they can take small area rugs and other items that previously were not included in our textile program just by virtue of the vendor. They take these items and they do some reselling and some reuse and some donation, and they make efforts not to use them as scrap cloth as is done with a lot of uh, textile recycling. So um, additionally, I think I've mentioned the other programs. But what I do want to tell you is the great news is that we have joined in with paint care and we're expecting to roll out latex paint recycling also um, in this coming month. So that is a, that's something you heard it here first on the Audubon meeting, it's not, not yet released, but we are going to be doing that. So that's a great example of um, what Peter Harkin was talking about earlier, which is an EPR program that is set up to encourage recycling. Um, So that's something. So this is really a great location. It's pretty central within the county, relatively speaking. Um, And you can take anything that you don't know what to do with, uh, and you can call and make an appointment so you know when the time is there for you. You know that it's available. And the next program that we're going to talk about is our compost and education facility, which we refer to as composted. Uh, Composted opened last Earth Day, not this past one, 2021, and that is a small-scale composting facility. It's designed to be more of a demonstration education site, but we do compost up to two tons of food scraps a week. Uh, We offer coursework classes for residents, uh, students, 
municipalities. It's scaled for a small municipality that is collecting and wants to manage that nearby, close to home, without any transport or with minimal transport. Uh, you can come, you can see how it works, you can learn how to do it in your backyard. And we talk about all the environmental benefits, which I'm sure everyone here knows from supporting wildlife by increasing the growth output of plants and carbon sequestration. And it helps with the erosion so that you're really supporting the land, which helps support the animals such as our birds. Them. So that's a great spot. That is also in Valhalla. So again, we're trying to keep things when we're available with space centralized to the county. Uh, the next program that we wanna talk about is our other newest program, which is our residential food scrap transportation and disposal program. Uh, as many of you know, food scraps constitute about 21% of municipal solid waste. And they are something that we can easily get out of our stream and produce something great with, as we just saw, compost, which has so many benefits uh, to the planet. So we have found that some of the municipalities within the county were trying to start programs or trying to maintain programs and that the cost was prohibitive for them. So what we did is we created this program whereby the county manages the transportation and disposal for these residential programs. They can be collection like Scarsdale has a curbside collection program, but the other locations have drop-off programs. So it's at the convenience of the residents. They can drop it off and we either arrange to pick it up or it can be brought to our subcontractor. And then we process that, we bulk it for transport so that we are minimizing the number of trips being taken to commercial compost locations. And that is also turned into compost. And on the list of municipalities, you can see a few that are bolded um, the largest of which would be White Plains and Yonkers. And those are municipalities that were able to commence a food scrap recycling program because of the county program. So it's completely voluntary. You don't have to join if your municipality is not looking to do it, but we've made it uh, extremely cost effective to do so, uh, cost neutral or cost saving actually. And um, it really, it, it's taken off. We're very happy and very proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish with that. And we just can look forward to continuing it, having, you know, continued growth in that. So, so before I go on to the, the first myth, I just wanted to go back a couple of comments about solid waste. I should have mentioned um, because, you know, uh, I, I mentioned zero waste goals. Uh, I should mention over the past 15 years, because of these programs we put in place at, at the county level and working with our municipalities, Residential solid waste in Westchester County has been reduced by 25%, over 25%, 26%. Um, that's, that's a phenomenal uh, number when, when you stop and think about it. It's, it's uh, approximately 150,000 tons a year of material. So, so we've reduced solid waste through recycling programs, through sustainability programs. Uh, residential solid waste by by over 25% in the last 15 years. I, I know we're going to take questions at the end, but I did see one question flash up that caught my eye. Um, somebody said, well, what do you do with the ash? The ash that, that is the byproduct of waste energy uh, does go to an ash fill, but it's about 10% of the original volume and it goes to uh, an ash fill. Um, we'll, uh, wind waste, the operator of the waste energy facility in Peekskill has petitioned the uh, DEC for um, beneficial uses for their ash. There are less benef beneficial uses allowed here than in some other areas, but they they are you know they they had been looking for that. But as of right now, the ash does go to an ash fill. So I just wanted to to answer that question. Um, myth number one. Uh, recyclables, recyclables aren't recycled. And this touches on what Peter uh, spoke about earlier uh, from, from a few years ago uh, when China really, uh, China was the driver of the recyclables market, the world recycling market. Uh, they were, they were the, the main buyer for, all, for most of our recycling uh, in the United States. Um, a, around, uh, around four years ago or so, China put contamination restrictions on that recycling that were so difficult to meet that they, in essence, operated on as a ban on the import of most recycling. Um, why did they do that? Well, on their end, it makes a lot of sense. They have a billion people making their own waste. They really didn't need to continue to import uh, our waste, especially contaminated waste. 
So uh, when China pulled out of the market, that was part of their national sword policy. When they pulled out of the market, uh, other countries, and mostly in, in East Asia, tried to fill that void, started buying the recyclables. They were soon overwhelmed. They too started uh, implementing the same, copying China, implementing the same type of contamination restrictions that China had put in place. I, I will tell you that there were horror stories everywhere. Uh, in the New York Times, there were stories on PBS and on Frontline in, in most major newspapers about major, major municipalities outside of New York State halting, suspending, shutting down recycling programs or continuing to have their, their residents separate their recyclables and that material was ending up in the trash. That did not happen in Westchester County. We were able to weather the storm throughout the whole uh, very you know, protracted uh, recycling market recession. We were able to continue to market all of our curbside recyclables. Why were we able to do that? I, I really, I, I generally, I touch on three reasons why we think we were able to do that. First of all, we have a highly, highly recycling educated population of residents here. Part of that, we'll, we'll pat ourselves on the back. Part of that is that we've had recycling education in place since 1992, a very robust program of recycling education. And we just have residents that want to do the right thing. Pete knows that Pete works, Pete McCart works with uh, recycling groups uh, throughout the county, with, I'm sorry, with uh, CACs throughout the county uh, that, that are constantly asking, how can we do a better job uh, with recycling and, and cleaning the recyclables. The second reason, we stayed dual stream when so much of the country uh, went single stream. So what am I talking about? Um, so, so dual stream recycling in Westchester is uh, a separation of your pulp recycling, your paper and cardboard, and your commingled recycling, your glass, plastic, and metals, your curbside recycling. Here in Westchester, that's two different streams. You have to separate them out, it might be a pain in the neck on recycling day, but it really makes a difference. Uh, it makes a difference because it keeps those recyclables so much cleaner. Uh, and just think about it, when you, when you throw uh, food and beverage containers in, your, in your, uh, your recycling bin, no matter how diligent you are, sometimes there's some kind of either, you know, residual food or, or residual beverage, beer, wine, soda, water, anything in that, in that container that's going to contaminate your pulp recycling um, when, when those are mixed, when those are mixed together. Uh, also the glass, what happens when you, when, when, when you throw glass around, it shatters, it breaks, those glass shards get embedded in the other recycling also reduces the value, contaminates the other recyclables and reduces the value. And that's what happens when you're, when you're single streaming a lot. It didn't matter when we were selling so much material overseas, there was a certain amount of contamination that was expected, that was built in. And, you know, we used to tell people, no, oh, when in doubt, recycle everything. Don't worry about it. They'll sort it out later on. When we were, we were part of our, you know, part, the other, the, the number two part of, of being able to weather this storm uh, during the recycle recession, recyclables recession was staying dual stream. And the third, we continue to upgrade our MRF. And I touched on this earlier with, with, uh, automated sorting equipment. We have optical sorters. We have paper screens. We have paper sort, optical paper sorters. Uh, we're continually looking for new equipment and investing in the MRF so that we can make a cleaner product. Because of all those things, we have one of the you know cleanest products we're offering in the region. We're able to continue to sell our material. That doesn't mean everything that comes into the MRF is sold. So what 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 am I talking about? The material we receive, about 6% of that material that comes into the MRF is rejected. It's either garbage that shouldn't have gone into the recycling can container. It might be wish cycling. That's when people say, oh, you know, this Keurig cup, I think it should be recyclable. I wish it was. I'm going to throw it in, right? So we, we, don't, we don't recycle those here. So or, or it's just uh, contaminated. It's the peanut butter jar that, that no one wanted to take the time to clean out. So that's that 6% that's rejected as garbage that comes into the MRF. Of that 92% that's left over, 
we're able to market and recycle and, and, and make sure that about 98% of that 92% continues to get recycled. So we have a very high, uh, we have a very, very high level of success with marketing our recycling. That's now, that was, that was during this whole recyclables market. Things can change, obviously. So, you know, the next time you see me, I hope to continue to be able to say that, but, but that is really um, the, the, the gist of it. And when I talked about waste reduction before, you know, I just want to be clear. People ask me all the time, what's, re- what's Westchester's recycling rate? Well, our recycling rate, is, it's good. It's not as high as they get out in Oregon, I don't believe. So, but our recycling rate's always over 50%, which is for this, this, for this region, for the Northeast, is really a phenomenal recycling rate. But recycling rates vary from year to year for a lot of reasons out of our control. First of all, it includes, when you're, when you're calculating a recycling rate, it includes organic matter. If there's a huge storm that's knocking down trees, uh, that is really going to kind of artificially boost your recycling rate that year. When there's massive construction projects, um, and, and I remember when Rich Hill was built, uh, our recycling rate, Rich Hill, the giant complex of, of uh, retail, doctor's offices, gyms, restaurants, um, and, and also, I think there are apartment buildings there. When that complex was built, our recycling rate that year went up 10%. So there's a lot of things because the rock and the dirt that's taken out of the ground, DEC counts that as recyclables, the, that material that goes, that's reused on construction sites. So I don't like to always look at recycling rate as an indicator about how the county's performing. That's why that waste reduction is so important, looking at that 25% reduction in the residential uh, uh, garbage rate, in the residential uh, way, you know, the amount of waste we're bringing to the rescue or the rescue facility. Well, I don't want to belabor your myth one, but I just wanted to make two statements for what you said. So you mentioned that single stream, sometimes it's more difficult on recycling day. I find that even though I'm outside the district and we are single stream where I am, we do it anyway in my house. It's because it actually makes it neater to keep your recyclables if you flatten all your boxes and papers and cardboards and pulps and keep them in a paper bag and then keep all your commingled, your bottles, cans, and in Westchester, also your cartons together in one container, um, not your cartons, <laughs> also in one container. It's a little bit easier. Sorry about that, Lou. Um, and then I would just point out that the little cartoon that you're seeing is part of our recycling education. And you, and should, also- mention who, you should mention the, the artist. Oh, the artist is my daughter. (laughs) Um, And that's one of our education programs. And also um, I put in the chat box a link to our most recent recycling card, which tries to capture where everything goes, um, where almost anything goes. It's a sort of a one-stop shop for recycling. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to mention those two things before I switch slides for you, Lou. It's so a myth are. too, and, and I should mention, the, these myths are, are only as it relates to Westchester, not, not every jurisdiction. But myth two, uh, people tell us all the time, why are we recycling? It isn't worth it. It costs a fortune for the county to recycle. Well, last year, we made a $2 million profit recycling the county. And that, and that $2 million goes back to the district. It doesn't just go to the county general fund. It goes back to the district so we can continue to invest in environmental programs in the county. Um, of course, we don't make a $2 million profit every year, but for most years, mar- recycling at least breaks even and pays for itself. The real benefit though, financially, is when you consider what it would cost to dispose of this material otherwise. So. If we weren't recycling this material, it would cost the county about $105 a ton to get rid of this material. So when you bring in the, 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 the opportunity cost that you're saving by recycling this material, recycling is well, well worth it financially here, here in Westchester at least. Okay, so the next question that we are, the next myth bust is, you just put everything in there, right? If I don't know, I just throw it in the container, they'll figure it out when it gets over to the uh, material recycling facility, but they can sort that out. Please don't do that. When in doubt, 
we say throw it out because what you're doing is you're creating contamination with other materials. A prime example of this is e-waste. When e-waste was first a thing and people said, you have to recycle your e-waste. How do I figure out what's e-waste? Well, if it's got a plug, it's e-waste. It, that does not make it e-waste. If it is a piece of plastic with a plug, it is not recyclable under an e-waste program. So we try and educate. Again, it's all about education and making sure that people know what is what. Up here, we have kind of split in half is our curbside recycling guide. You can see it tells you where to put everything um, that you might encounter in your curbside. You'll see um, Cartons are a little bit unusual, and I kind of touched on that, and then I backtracked on the last slide because I didn't want to get into it too soon. But cartons are a little unusual usual for Westchester's district because they go in with your commingled. Because they're a pulp product, people think to put them with paper, but because they have a liquid in them, they can make that paper wet, and wet paper is contaminated paper. So we try and keep everything as dry as possible. So what happens is when those cartons and those commingled containers come to our facility, we are able to separate them out. Um, that way we both protect the paper and we still manage to recycle the pulp out of the cartons and everything else that's included in those. So we have these guides. It shows you exactly what to do and where to put things. So Lou mentioned earlier a peanut butter jar. We have a lot of times we have questions. We've had people bring us examples, which we're happy to do when we were pre-COVID and we were all in person and someone would hold up a container and say to Lou, Lou, is this clean enough? And I would look at it and say thumbs up or thumbs down. So what you want to try and do is clean it as much as you can. Um, if you cannot get it out, if you look at it and it is more garbage than it is recyclable, if you look at that container and you say, there's a bunch of peanut butter at the bottom, but I bought that natural stuff. The kids didn't stir it. The oil's out of it. I can't get this dried peanut butter on the bottom. And frankly, I don't want to play with it. If that is how you feel, you can throw that container out. But if you can soak it and you can get that out, you can scrape it out with a spatula and get rid of that extra peanut butter, please put that jar right into the recycling and we will handle it for you. So Melissa, can you just touch on uh, plastic bags? I saw something come up and, and people were asking about plastic bags, which are the bane of our existence at the moment. Okay. So I tried to answer, I've been trying to, to answer the chats as we were talking, because um, I didn't want to uh, have to interrupt. But yes, yeah, so plastic bags, we don't like plastic bags. Um, they are not our friend. Uh, the state has a recycling program. So plastic bags can go with your bread bags and all your other bags right to a supermarket where they can be recycled. But if you put your commingled in them and they get to our material recovery facility, they are going to, as they say, gum up the works. They get stuck in the belts. They get stuck in the machinery. They cause jams. They can cause fires. They can cause machinery breakdown. They cause delays. They could injure someone. They really are very difficult. We, um, the comics that you saw one before, we actually did one. It's up on Facebook about the bags. Uh, we, we, you know, listen, we reach out on Facebook. We reach out during these seminars. We do them with all kinds of groups. We communicate with CACs. We communicate with schools. We communicate with DPWs. We try and get this information out as much as possible. Uh, you know, the best thing to do is if you run out of space and you think I'm going to put this in a plastic bag, put it in a different container. I'd prefer if you put it in one box, in a ruined one box, um, than ruined, uh, you know, a, a machine at the facility. Plastic bags are really, the plastic van bag that went into effect should help that going forward, but people still use trash bags for the recyclables. You don't need to have a blue container. They're great if you have them. If you run out of space, any container will do. Uh, you can, if it's out there, your DPWs will take them, but we do ask that people don't put them in plastic bags. Um, you know, we have another question. There's a couple questions about plastic bags. In fact, um, someone said about they live in an apartment building and they put everything in the plastic bags. You know, we try and reach out to them and communicate with apartment buildings too. We've been working with um, some of the management companies that manage several apartment buildings to try and get them to understand it so that when they're working with the janitors, they can also do that. You know, we understand that in some instances, there are cases where for sanitary reasons, um, you may need to do it. We try to, you know, open them whenever we can, break them open, take the recyclables out, prevent the plastic bags from getting into the machines. But, um, 
And, and that material, <laughs> when you're putting in a plastic bag, that material might not get recycled because it's it's going through the MRF. It's going to go through the first level of uh, uh, quality control where there are uh, the, the pickers that Peter had spoken about who are separating out, trying to grab those bags and separating about. They're going by really quick on a, on a conve conveyor belt. If they miss it, it's going to come by a second time, but eventually it might get rejected. So uh, a lot of that material, if you're putting it in a plastic bag and you think, well, you know, they'll have to pull the bag, it might not get recycled, that material. Um, Lou, I want to hit a couple more questions if we have the time or do we want to wait? I don't want to, Sarah, I don't want to step on your presentation and your your schedule or Tom I, or Ken, but if we have a minute or two, um, I'll just talk and you can stop me if I'm over. Uh, so there's a couple of questions in here. Someone said, uh, we know that some numbers are just not recyclable. Should we throw out everything except one and two? No, we recycle one through yeah. seven. That I will refer you back to the myth. I know that um, Oregon <sighs> indicated that they had been collecting and had nothing to do with some items and they had to throw them out. That did not happen in Westchester. We have been able to market everything. We may not be making a ton of money on it. We may be, you know, taking pennies, but we have been able to market it. And we are lucky in that we had been able to also store some items as market shift. So, you know, we can set the material out, we can bail it, we can truck it, um, containerize it, I mean, put it into a, a, into a container and set it and wait for a market. And, um, you know, so that we recycle everything. So please, one through seven, put it in there. Um, and as far as credit cards and thermal paper, uh, thermal paper actually is not um, recyclable. Uh, that's something that uh, I usually ask them to, if they cannot print the receipt or email me the receipt, that's big now. A lot of places, if you give them their email, my suggestion on that is I have a separate email address that all that kind of garbage goes to. So it doesn't flood my regular email address. Uh, that would be my suggestion. I'm keeping your email a little bit clean, uh, but you can send Please, if they do an email, let them send it to you because those are not recyclable in any way. Um, someone has asked about the HMRF and paint care. That was what I mentioned earlier, that we are scheduled for paint care. We don't have an exam. I'm waiting for confirmation. We are all signed up. It's just a matter of logistics. So it will be in May. It may not be until May 4th or 5th. We will, we will issue a big press release. You will know when it happens, Kent. Um, but in the meantime, we are going to be taking paint at our household uh, recycling day uh, on May 7th, which is a Saturday. It's at Spring Ridge Park. We are already secured to take latex and other paints um, on that date. Um, so styrofoam. Yeah, so sty styrofoam. Uh, the Westchester County does not have a styrofoam uh, program, styrofoam recycling. Uh, some of the municipalities do, though, so it really depends on where you live. I know Yonkers has uh, a recycling program for styrofoam. Um, the reason we don't, styrofoam is a very, very bulky material that does not have a lot of weight. Um, the amount of styrofoam we would receive on a county level, uh, we would have to emulsify, reduce. There's a very limited market for it. Um, and we would have to have a lot of labor involved in handling it on a, on a county level. But there are municipalities that are able to do that. So you should check with your, your local municipality. Um, is rain on pickup day a problem for mixed paper? It's not great. I won't lie to you. Please don't put, if, if you know it's going to rain and you can put your paper out before the collection instead of the night before, you know, we would appreciate it. Um, the paper is very stringent now. They actually do um, moisture tests when they come to buy it. So, you know, we do work to keep it dry and, you know, to the extent that we can let it re let it dry, keep it dry. <laughs> that's, that's sort of what we do. So we, we make a lot of efforts with that. The best thing is a covered recycling container. If you have one, not all municipalities provide them, but I would feel confident that if you were to obtain one, and uh, I'm sure you can work with your collection crew to make sure that it gets collected as recyclables. If it's out on recyclable day and it's full of recyclables, uh, it doesn't usually need to say uh, city of, town of. Um, 
in order to be a recyclable container. Yeah, and, and that and that wet that wet paper and cardboard Melissa just touched on, that's part of that six percent that gets rejected at the MRF. If it's too wet, uh, we we can't process it or or sell it. 